Hi, welcome to the first lecture in a series of introductory lectures to mathematical optimization. This lecture is prepared within a course on optimal and robust control given at Czech Technical University in Prague in 2017. The problem that will keep us busy for quite some time is this. We would like to minimize the value of a scalar function f, function that we will call a cost function or a criterion or an optimization index. And this will be a function of a variable x which in general can be a vector variable. That means it will be an n-tuple of real variables x1 through xn. Moreover, the, our optimal solution will have to comply with a set of uh, constraints. They will be both of equality type, a number of them, and inequality type, again a number of them. Now you may want to ask why on earth are we so biased towards minimization when maximization can also be needed in some uh, situations. The answer uh, you have just seen, the answer is that uh, you can reformulate your maximization into minimization. In this video we will disregard uh, constraints temporarily and we will also restrict ourselves just to scalar variables. That, uh, that means we are going to investigate unconstrained optimization, unconstrained minimization in the scalar case. So the problem uh, may already look familiar. We will consider function, for, in, for instance, of uh, this shape. And uh, we will try to find uh, x which minimizes the value of this function. Obviously, the minimizing x uh, is identified right over here. We'll label it x opt. And the corresponding value of the function is global minimum, with the obvious definition that global minimum is the value that for no other x you can achieve anything smaller. There is, however, another interesting point, in which we label x star. And this will be local minimizer, and the corresponding value is local minimum. Uh, what's the definition of local minimum? Well, it behaves as a minimum, but only in uh, some local neighborhood. More rigorously, we will classify the x star as local minimum if there exists some, however small, epsilon, such that if we perturb x star by some alpha smaller in absolute value than epsilon, we cannot achieve smaller value of f than at x star. Implicit in uh, this were two assumptions. First, I assume here and throughout uh, the following lectures that our variables are real. We will not consider integer variables. Second, we will assume that the function f is nice. That means it's continuous and the first few derivatives exist. There is also another assumption which uh, we will actually do not need at the very beginning and that is that the function is convex. So let's let's talk about uh, convexity of a function. For, for a convex function it holds that if you evaluate the function at two different points like uh, these two x x1 and x2 and if you connect the uh, the corresponding points on the graph with a line then the true graph always lies below this interconnecting line segment more formally the value of the function at the convex combination of the two points at one x1 and x2 is always below a convex combination of the two function values now What's the reason for, for studying convexity of functions? Well, the reason is that for convex functions, once you identify a local minimum, you are guaranteed that it will also work fine as a global minimum. Now, the question is uh, whether global minimum is actually guaranteed to exist for a given problem. For instance, have a look at, uh, at the following function. Uh, 
well, just just a real, a real linear linear function. Obviously, here <coughs> the minimum value is uh, uh, minus infinity. Or another situation here, the there is some finite minima minimum value. However, it's not achieved for any finite x. <coughs> Therefore, we are asking a question: under which conditions we are guaranteed to have a finite uh, minimizer which achieves a finite value? And the answer is uh, sketched in the figure here. So more formally. The function needs to satisfy the following condition. For x growing in absolute value to infinity, the value of the function must grow to infinity as well. Such functions are called coercive. So for coercive functions we are guaranteed to have a global minimizer. Now back to the local viewpoint. We will now study how the function evolves in the neighborhood of the local minimum or local minimizer. So, the local uh, minimizer here will be labeled as before x star and we will perturb it slightly. So, the, the Taylor theorem tells us that we can write the value in the perturbed uh, point uh, with this infinite series, where now the ellipses stand for higher order terms. We typically just say higher order terms, but let me now be a little bit more explicit in what we mean. We, you can encounter one of the two uh, notations, either the so-called big O or uh, little o. So let's first talk about big O notation. We say that the function is O alpha 3. If for alpha going to 0, uh, our function is upper bounded by a constant times uh, alpha uh, to, to the 3. Equivalently, we can uh, write, uh, write it like this, where m actually is some uh, finite number. And what does it mean? It simply means that the function goes to 0 uh, no smaller than a cubic function. Alternatively, for little o, we are saying that the function goes to 0 faster than, uh, in this case, than a quadratic function. So, two different concepts for describing the same situation. Now, let's go back to Taylor. I'll first move the value of the function at the minimizer to the left-hand side and defined, uh, define an increment. Then, what's left on the right-hand side is this. And I know that in a local minimum, uh, I must have this term non-negative. Now, uh, since the first of the two terms on the right hand side is linear in alpha, I can see that the only way to guarantee that uh, the sign cannot go or that the function cannot go arbitrarily below zero is that the derivative is equal to zero. And hence we have uh, the first order necessary condition of optimality. The point which satisfies this is called actually a critical point or sometimes stationary point. Now that we have learned something about the first derivative, we have learned that it must vanish, we can also learn something about the second derivative. In particular, we can argue that in the Taylor's expansion, the sum of second order term and the higher order term must uh, be non-negative. But then, even though for a given alpha, uh, the higher order terms can be larger in absolute value than the second order terms, we can argue that for sufficiently small alpha, if we go towards a zero, the, sooner or later the second order term will dominate all the higher order terms. But then it follows that it's the second order term that necessarily must be non-negative. And uh, since uh, the, uh, the squared alpha is always non-negative, it follows that it's the second derivative of f that must be non-negative. So this way we derived second order necessary condition. Now, uh, how about uh, the sufficiency? How about the sufficient conditions of optimality? Well, uh, 
Obviously, uh, the first derivative must vanish and the second derivative must be non-zero. These are sufficient conditions of optimality, but be careful, these are then not necessary. These are just sufficient conditions. And let me illustrate the caveat here by means of an example. We will consider a simple quartic function, x to the 4, for which the graph looks uh, some, something like this. Obviously, the minimum, both local and global one, is uh, attained at the point 0. Now, the first derivative, when evaluated at 0, vanishes. How about the second derivative? Obviously, the second derivative vanishes as well, but here you see that uh, we did achieve minimum, and yet the second derivative was zero. So apparently, it was not necessary for the second derivative to be non-zero, right? Uh, in order to analyze what's going on here, without looking at the graph of the function, we need to consider higher order terms. So let's compute the third derivative. Apparently, the third derivative vanishes at zero as well. Let's go for the fourth one. Oh, here it is. It's finally the fourth derivative that does not vanish. It's uh, non-zero. In fact, it's uh, positive. And since it's associated with, uh, with an even power of alpha, we can go argue that uh, x at zero is a local minimizer.